Hi folks, uh, this is Jason and I uh, hope you are okay today. Uh, this is a public lecture on um, the Christology of Karl Barth and I hope this is a blessing to you. Um, this lecture will not be a normal way of expounding Karl Barth. Uh, we shall try a new method, a method that is growing among some academics. That method is to go behind what Barth says. Every theologian has a context. If we understood the intellectual and cultural context of Barth, uh, it will shed great light on his Christology. This lecture will be in six parts. Barth in context. Barth. Third, testing the foundations. Fourth, living under the shadow of Kant. Five, three reformed theologians, and then six, Bart on Bart. Bart in context, his intellectual development and theology in general. Bart was born in 1886. He was brought up in a God-fearing family. In his student days, Bart went to study at Marburg and Tübingen. At this time, about 1909, there was a great intellectual rest in Europe. Expressionism was a sign of the times, a revolt against the Philistine culture. Barth writes, quote, We find ourselves in a deep dis disfaction with everything hereafter. End of quote. The thinkers who influenced Barth in his student days were Cohen and Wilhelm Hermann. Cohen was a philosopher who saw God as important to fill the gaps. Hermann was much more important to Barth's development and influence in his Christology. As a true Kantian, Hermann thought religion was independent of science. Hermann also had a deep-seated dislike of natural theology. Hermann's epistemology started with God, and he was a despiser of historical relativism. By 1913, Barth was now a pastor. He began to preach on God's wrath. He was much involved in socialist activities, but already Barth was growing as a theologian. He reacted against his peers who signed the manifesto back in the German government. He was developing his epistemology, trying to make God the ground of knowledge to the knower. From 1915 to 1920, Barth's dialectical method was in full swing. Quote, Barth's theological development from this point on represented a single theme, God is God. End of quote, uh, McGormack. This epistemology was also, also influenced by his brother Henrik Barth, 1890-1965. Quote, God, not essence, but pure ursprung of everything that is. End of quote. McGormack. By the time Barth had written Romans, he was influenced by Franz Overbeck, 1837-1905. He began to see the incarnation as a divine possibility. Kant's philosophy he still took for granted. Quote, Barth was anti-metaphysical in character, end of quote, McGormack. But Barth's Christology was not at all well developed until after he started lecturing at Göttingen in 1924. His first attempts at Christology were in relation to Revelation. Quote, it would be more accurate to Barth's intentions to say that Jesus of Nazareth standing on the plane of history is not even the medium of revelation. As a historical figure, Jesus is the veil of revelation, but no more than that. End of quote. McGormack. Quote, it means, it, it means that the new world touches the old world at a single point without extension along the line of historical time. End of quote. The veiling and unveiling ideas Barth kept throughout his theological development, but his time and eternity apparatus he did not take seriously. He now began to ground his theology more in Christology, using Reformed Dogmaticus as a basis. Quote, Before turning to Barth's interpretation of the Incarnation, it should be noted that in presupposing the self-revelation of God in Jesus Christ, Barth was placing the Orthodox Christology of the 16th, 16th century on entirely new formation. End of quote. Uh, McGormack. Quote, what is in view is a unity in different action, a strictly dialectical union, which nowhere sets aside the qualitative distinction. By 1925 to 30, Barth never went back on his general idea of the presence of God. 
and the veil of creaturely flesh being a presence in reality that is different from God. The only difference now, as from his early days, Bath now saw the whole of Christ's life as significant, not just the cross and the resurrection. Also at this time, Bath was not happy with Bruner's apologetics. As for Bath, Buchan and Salmi did not change his Christology significantly. This is just a skeleton of some key developments in Bath's thinking. Some of Bath's overall theology are as follows. Number one, hermeneutics. Secular culture must not be allowed to bring its tools and impose itself on the text. Number two, revelation, God's words and existential act. Number three, theology is a worshipping of God with our whole mind so we might enjoy him and bring glory to him. For what is a bringer of knowledge to the knower, the knower has in no ability, has, ha, the knower has no ability to know God. Five, Christological thinking tells us let God be God. Next, Bart, Bart's uh, Christology. In Bart's Gottingham Lectures, Bart says we can never take God's place. God is a living God. God can do all things. Bart says that no person can do what God does, that is, become an object perceptible to others. God is the only one that can make himself known. Next, he says that God must use a person, a real person, but conceal himself. God must not be a direct revealer. God must truly meet man, so that Jesus must be a literal human, not an angel or a phantom. Next, Bath says that deity and humanity must be united, but they must not be mixed into each other. Quote, Loose inasmuch as the deity does not pass into the humanity, or the humanity become identical um, with deity. It must be strictly dialectical union. The deity and humanity must be distinguished in such a way that we cannot detract the one from the other. End of quote. Bart then goes on to say that the deity must not be above the humanity of Jesus. The incarnation must be seen as one for all event. The next points out that the incarnation is the objective possibility of revelation. But it's the end of Jesus' life that has more significance for Christology. The traditional view here that history is important for Christology is left behind. The Bible for Bart is not closed revelation, but others outside the Bible could receive revelation. For Bath, indirect communication equals God's incarnation. Bath then points out that Jesus, the man, is God himself who reveals God himself. That becomes man. This point he makes clear, then he notes that we have to remember that there is depth in God beyond the Incarnation. For Bath, the Incarnation is the answer to man's contradictory existence. He states this position so dazzling here, quote, It is not a changing of the divine nature of the Son, but with his divine mode of existence, the Son takes a human mode of existence, uniting it, the grace of union to his person, just as the divine mode of existence is an eternally united to his person, yet without any way altering his divine mode of existence. End of quote. Uh, page 156. Quote, uh, that was Karl Barth. Not, quote again, not the deity become man, but the son, although naturally without ceasing to be who he is, and therein, and with his entire deity, in contrast to the human nature that the son assumes and unites to his person, is the persons. The substance of man, his being, is a body and soul with all the limitations of the limitations this means. End of quote. Karl Barth. Quote, the logos in Christ's flesh and the logos outside Christ's flesh are naturally not two different ent entities. The one a revealing part of the logos and the other a part that remains hidden. Quote, uh, end of quote. Bromley, page 2-5. Bath's view changed a little in his life. In his Christology, in the dogmatics expand in John 1.14, we have the following teaching. Number one, word is very God. The word is subject of what happens. The word acts in divine freedom. The word does not stop to be free or sovereign in becoming flesh. If God is the subject, then, then matter, then mother of God idea is correct, but Mariology is to be rejected. A true humanity, uh, his flesh participates in all the human nature or essence. He is reckoned a sinner 
on our behalf, flesh denotes likeness, it points to sinless life and obedience. End of quote. Bromley, page 2.5. When in the Bible text he says become, Barth insists it does not mean surrender a being as the word. That is why Barth liked to use the word assumed as it protected the integrity of the word. Barth kept up his love of seeing Jesus as the concrete existence that makes history real and reveals God. Quote, the heart of the object of Christian faith is the word of the action which God from all eternity will to become man in Jesus Christ. End of quote. Bath Dogmatics Outline, page 65. Testing the Foundations, McGrath and Hart. What was Bath trying to do in his Christology? Bath to free theology from culture. He writes, quote, page 31, McGrath. For Bart, the recognition that God revealed himself as Lord in Jesus Christ was the means by which theology could be freed from the baleful influence of culture, anthropology, metaphysical, allowing it initially to become emancipated from its cultural matrix and subsequently to develop and maintain its intellectual autonomy. End of quote. This helps us to start on a critical assessment of Bart's Christology. In my reading of his lectures on Gottingen, the dogmatics in outline and other pieces, one is actually aware how abstract Bath's Christology is. It is totally unrelated to the world he wrote in. When he writes about the man Jesus, it is never in the context of how he relates to man in the 20th century, and most certainly not to specific life situations. This lack of bringing Christology into reflection with the culture of the day stifles debate and development. Quote, to detach oneself from a tradition is to impede the process of understanding which takes place within precisely such a tradition, end of quote, McGrath, page 34. The next problem we have with Bar's Christology is he tried to minimize the importance of history in its classical sense. History for him was not a sure basis to construct theology. In a sense, Barth wants us to receive Christ as a possibility without data. I think this means the word does not really become flesh in space-time, but hovers over flesh in the recipient of faith. Quote, if Bath's Logos truly became Sarx, the particular way in which the becoming of the union between the two is consistently construed in his theology, nonetheless risk reducing it to the point where it loses all purchase in the real world, thereby robbing it of genuine redemptive and relative, uh, relative, relative, relevatory substance, end of quote. It has also been noted that Barth tried to deal with Furenbach's accusation against 19th century theology.